Dr. Kurzweil, you claim to be an atheist. Rabbi Steinsoltz, you have mentioned many times that you have never met a true atheist. Dr. Kurzweil, could you elaborate on this? Uh, where, where did I ever say that? I, 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 I read about you and that. Well, that maybe you read said, it in a newspaper uh, article, but I, I don't think I ever uh, used those words. Okay. Um, another, so, another atheist gun. Yeah. <laughs> so. so in, in, my, in my view. Uh, we can keep it short then. <laughs> In my view, evolution is a spiritual process because God is described as being infinite, unlimited in what? In intelligence, knowledge, beauty, creativity, love. What happens to entities as they evolve? Either biological evolution or technological evolution. They become more knowledgeable, intelligent, creative, beautiful, capable of expressing higher level emotions like love. So they're moving in a spiritual direction, getting closer to this ideal that we, we describe as God. And I think actually atheists and so-called believers uh, agree on the fundamental issue, which is the sacredness of beings who are conscious. Uh, a, a conscious being, like for example, a human, is a sacred uh, entity. And everybody agrees on that. And maybe the derivation of how those entities got that way may differ, the words and metaphors are different, but um, so I believe in the, in the sanctity of what a believer might call the soul, but of conscious beings. And I believe that evolution moves us closer to this ideal of God. And uh, you know, the, the word God has many different meanings in these different traditions. So you know, do you believe in God? It's not a well-defined question. Okay. And what would, you, what would be your relationship to Judaism then? Well, I, th I think Rabbi Seinsaltz has expressed it well in, in Arthur's quote, uh, which is to question the truth and to seek truth. Uh, why are we here? What are we supposed to do? What's important? Who and what do we value? Uh, the sanctity of human ideas. Uh, my grandfather came back from his first return trip to Europe after fleeing Hitler, and he was given the opportunity to handle with his own hands uh, documents by Leonardo da Vinci. And these were sacred documents. But they weren't uh, written by God or, or handed down by God. They were written by a human. So the power of human ideas uh, was what was sacred. And I think that's very much in the Jewish tradition and to constantly seek better insight into the truth. All right. R uh, Rabbi Sanzold, so would you... It, it kind would, of you, would I fight with him? No, he, he's doing, he did a, such a nice, nice sermon. Much better than most American rabbis do. So, I, <laughs> so why should I why should I find something so beautiful? I basically, basically, see. Uh, look, uh, when you sometimes when when you go to kindergartens, and uh, sometimes the, the the teachers in kindergartens spoil the children when they speak about uh, about God because children, small children are very much, very interested. They are interested in everything. This is a great advantage. With, uh, unluckily, like chimpanzees, they, with the time, they become usually less curious and less interested. But basically, when they are young, uh, so they, they are lots of ideas about God and other things. So, so let's say, uh, um, they, they ask questions. And uh, what can I say? Uh, one of my pupils once, came to, to me, he wanted to help in the kindergarten. So, okay, I said, okay, it's a very good idea. So, he went there, he said, what do, about what do I speak to them? I said, I said, it would be a nice idea to speak about God, because the, the image the kindergarten teachers make is, there is somebody, some huge, some huge man sitting in heaven, with a long white beard, with a stick in one hand and a, and a bunch of candies in the other hand. So I say, you, you spoil the children, you, make, you give them all kinds of false Im images. So, so, so he said, so what will I say? And I said, try to tell them that God is infinity, is infinite. Try to tell them, speak to them about it. 
Of course, it's not. It, you don't have to use these words, but you have to give them to give them some notion about it. So after some time, some time it comes. So I say, how was the experience? He said the experience was bas basically very good. The children, the children accepted my idea. Of what God is? The, the problem I had with the teacher, she didn't. Get, she didn't get it. So that, that's what I have all the time. But otherwise, otherwise, uh, see. What is God? And, and, and the, the, the other side says, you donkey do, you. What kind of a question it is? There's no, no, no thought can grasp him and no place can hold him. That, that's a, a nice definition of God, but you won't, you won't fight with it, right? So, so we, have, we, we didn't come to any, anything really meaty. Right, so, no, so we, we will continue. Some we'll, of these stories that children learn are scary, like uh, Noah's Ark. Yes, yeah. uh, and maybe a little bit fictional too. So. Well, let's debate about that. Yeah. So, um, Dr. Kurzweil, um, for someone that I, con doing the research for this interview, for someone that I considered fairly open-minded and not necessarily be religious in terms of one, orientation um, that in you it was interesting to see that in you rock you use a lot of religious terminology for example you have said that not so many years from now 20 30 years from now we as human will be more godlike could you elaborate on that well as i said before god is described as being unlimited in in what in intelligence creativity uh, ability to express higher level emotion. So, actually, in this last book I wrote, which landed me at Google because Larry Page liked it, um, I described the neocortex, which is where we do our thinking, as a hierarchy of different modules. And we have 300 million of them. And two million years ago, we got a bunch more. We got these large foreheads, the frontal cortex. And it's actually not qualitatively different. It was additional quantity of neocortex. And before, we got that, we were doing a very good job of being primates, but now we had this additional neocortex, so we put it at the top of the hierarchy. And as you go up the hierarchy, concepts get more abstract, more general, more powerful. So humor and music are done at the top of the hierarchy. So we put it at the top of the hierarchy, and that was what enabled us to invent language and music and art. No other animal, no other primate ever did that. We're going to uh, do that again. We're going to connect wirelessly this 2030 scenario, our neocortex to the cloud. And just as I can expand, expand this and make this 10,000 computers by connecting it wirelessly to the cloud, if I do something interesting, it, it connects to the cloud and multiplies itself. I can access millions of computers of knowledge. We'll do that directly from our neocortex, connecting to synthetic neocortex. Cause I believe we already understand pretty well how these modules work and we can create synthetic ones. And, uh, so what will we do with that additional neocortex? We'll do the same thing we did two million years ago. We'll put it at the top of the hierarchy and we'll create more profound music and art and science. We'll be funnier. We'll be better at expressing loving sentiments and therefore closer to God because we'll be more intelligent and more creative uh, not becoming infinite, we never become infinite, so God is this ideal of unlimited uh, levels of these qualities, uh, but we get closer to that, to that ideal. Um, Rabbi Sanzols, um, as we're hearing Dr. Kurzweil say, he believes there are no limits to progress. Yes. What are your thoughts on progress and human limitations? Look, as a Jew, I have a, a huge advantage over most religions. As a Jew, we, in a strange way, we believe in progress. Usually, religions are, are reactionary by definition, they, because they think about the past, and they think about the perfect past. See, in, I, wrote, I wrote about it. It's something possibly, I'm afraid, that you possibly had it in your youth, but you didn't, didn't have it, see. The idea, I said that, I once made a speech about the connection between Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, and Mao Zedong. And I said that basically Moshe Rabbeinu invented the basic idea that created also Mao Zedong. 
mostly to get marks and so all the, all the rest in the, in the way. Because up to a certain time, in one of the, of the tenets of, of religion was, well, it was primitive, primitive, uh, no northern religion, see. Uh, uh, what we have, the dimming, dimming of the good, of the gods. And although it was, it was Babylonian, Assyrian, Egyptian notion. It was the idea. There was somewhere, sometimes there was, it was a wonderful time, the age of gold, and it is deteriorates until it goes to to sink in some kind of of thing. This is, this this idea is, is important important in human development, and it was really what happened in the possibly in the in the Second World War was a, also a part of it. But anyway, Judaism had the idea that the world doesn't go always. It doesn't. You do, you have to look to to a future that will be more glorious than the past. So this is one thing. The other thing is we have we say it every week in the, in the Kiddush of Shabbat. We say that God created it's a Shabbat looking at which is God created to do, which is in a way we are the idea. Basic idea is that man is a kind of a partner. Man is a partner of God, and he he has to do he has to better the things. That they were created. There was a, a discussion about 2,000 years ago about it. What is better? And the rabbi says that, of course, human-made things are better than, than God-made things. As we know more, we know more about what we don't know and what we want. If you would ask a uh, quintessential cave man and woman uh, what he wanted, what they wanted, uh, Said, well, I'd like a bigger stone to keep the animals out, and uh, maybe something to keep the fire from going out. And well, don't you want a better website? And uh, and so that we, our uh, desires and our uh, concept of what we want and what will be fulfilling continues to expand. And I think that's what I value in Judaism: is it's really focused on human experience uh, as it actually exists and identifying real suffering and trying to overcome that. And that's recognized as a positive thing. And we have done that. There's still a lot of suffering, but if you read about what human life is like, say Thomas Hobbes just a few centuries ago uh, describes human life as short, brutish, disaster-prone, disease-filled, poverty-filled. Life was extremely difficult. Even the poor today have amenities that the kings and queens didn't have as a century ago, like flush toilets, refrigerators, radios, televisions, yes. not to mention computers. Um, so human life is getting better, but we also identify things that we never knew we wanted. It's not what we want. We can, we can always invent some, some other things, even though we will be always limited by our bodies. And our bodies will, will limit so, so how, you know, it's one of the things, possibly, some of the students here should, should delete it immediately. What I'm saying, you see, I, 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 I know a little bit what's happening. I, I didn't find that they invented any new sin in the last 2,000 years. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. See, people work in it. People write things. Really, all the sins are the same ones. And I'm afraid that it, if it goes on like this, say, you have two... To, you have all the all the information you had. You have all the imagination you had. But the only thing that you can do is think about the old sins. Well, we find new ways to do them. I think. Yes, yeah. new ways. That's <laughs> exactly that. And we already do some of these things. But we become exponential. <laughs> so on that note, uh, Dr. Kurzweil, I would like to ask you: You have made hundreds of predictions, out of which many already have come true, and with no doubt, many more will come true. But if you would have to single out your three, three most important predictions uh, for the upcoming decade, what would they be? Well, one is uh, health and medicine. We talked about our bodies, and our bodies are basically actually information because it's governed by our genes, their information processes. We didn't used to treat it that way. We just, it was basically hit or miss. We'd find something, oh, here's something that lowers blood pressure, here's something that kills HIV, and we'd find these things accidentally. So progress was linear. Still valuable. I gave a speech to 12 and 13 year old science winners recently, and I said you all would be senior citizens if it hadn't been for this progress, because life 
expectancy was 19 a thousand years ago. But this is going to go into high gear now. It, uh, the enabling factor for health and medicine to become an information technology was the Genome Project. That itself was a perfect exponential. And we now have this, the uh, software of life. And we're also making exponential progress in being able to model it, simulate it, understand it, and reprogram it. And I could speak at great length about examples of how we're doing that. You can, for example, now fix a broken heart, not yet from romance, that'll take a few more developments in virtual reality, but from a heart attack. Uh, Amy's grandfather, my father, had a heart attack in the 60s. There's nothing you could do about it. He could hardly walk. But I've talked to people now who could hardly walk and are now rejuvenated. You actually have to be a medical tourist and go to a place like Israel. Uh, but that's just one example of many. And what is now a sort of a trickle of these developments is going to be a flood. Ten years from now, these technologies will be a thousand times more powerful than they are today because they're doubling in power every year. They'll be a million times more powerful in 20 years. We'll reach a point 10 to 20 years from now, probably closer to 10, where we're adding more than a year every year, not just to infant life expectancy, but to your remaining life expectancy. Now, life expectancy is a statistical phenomenon. You could have a life expectancy of 50 years, 80 years, and be hit by the proverbial bus tomorrow. But we're working on that, too, with self-driving cars. Uh, and so maybe within 15 years from now, you go forward a year, your life expectancy will move on away from you. So if you can hang in there, uh, we may get to experience this remarkable uh, century ahead. So that's one development. Another is virtual reality, three-dimensional printing. We're going to be able to print all the things we need, clothing, even organs. That's actually being experimented with now. It's been done successfully in animals, printing out actual uh, kidneys and lungs and hearts. That will be done in humans within a decade. Uh, and most importantly, artificial intelligence. That's been my passion for 50 years creating systems that uh, have this kind of hierarchical neocortex that can reason like a human, deal with language like a human. But what we'll use them for is not some alien invasion of intelligent machines as if they came from Mars, but actually to enhance our own intelligence. I mean, this does make us smarter. And ultimately, it's going to go inside our bodies and brains. And that's why we create these tools. That's what's unique about humans. We go beyond our limitations. We couldn't reach that higher fruit at that branch a thousand years ago, so we invented a tool extending our reach. And then we leveraged our muscles to create the pyramids and great structures. Now we can access all of human knowledge with a few keystrokes, and ultimately we'll directly expand our intelligence. That's, that's what's uniquely human. People say, well, but we're going to stop being human if we merge with machines. No, that is what it means to be human. Well, what are you curious about? Dr. Stein's, uh, I, uh, Dr. I, I, okay, but what I'm curious about. Curious about, about him. About everything. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I didn't go up from the age of, of one or two. I'm well, still curious about well, everything. Well, I think everything is going to be transformed at a certain level. I think our values are going to remain the same, uh, valuing humanity. But in my view, what, what's unique about humans is, is that we are the species that changes who we are and we transcend our limitations. So transcendence is a key word for humanity. And, Would, and all these different abilities, our experience in virtual reality, our ability to create physical see, objects, see, our, our a life expectancy, all of that's going to expand. When a, when a person that speaks about science, speaks about transcendence, you mm -hmm. see, she, she, you, cannot, you can't do anything to him. He's, he's immune already, you see. He speaks <laughs> about transcendence, he speaks about, about higher values and so on. So I said, in, I had it many times, that meeting, uh, meeting so sometimes uh, people that are known as, as atheists or, or something like this, I say, if, the, if just if you cheat a few, few words of yours, you, you can become such a wonderful rabbi. So. <laughs> do, do, uh, do you believe that at the fundamental level you're much closer on your views than you maybe have believed before we started this interview? I, I thought, I say, I didn't know anything about, about it. I say, I didn't know about a person. Now, I know more, more about a person. I would say, this person is more likable than my images. Dr. <laughs> Kurtz, are you on the front? Uh, I felt we were very 
compatible to begin with. I, I think the, the rabbi has been excellent at articulating the wisdom that comes from the ages and from this great Jewish tradition. And the Jewish tradition is a value for humanity in the here and now, and improving the human condition. Uh, and that goes back thousands of years, and that's articulated very well. So we are at the finish line of